Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. Amen. Our text for today, if you can have a text on Trinity Sunday, is the Old Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, read just a few moments ago. As has been mentioned, today is Trinity Sunday. I think it is one of these days that is, well, something of a nightmare for preachers. After all, what am I supposed to do? I had someone, in a joking way, don't worry, last week, tell me that they were excited for me to explain the ins and outs of the Trinity for you all today, and um, I'm not going to do that. I kind of tried a few years ago, and quite frankly, it didn't go terribly well. Well, honestly, most Trinity Sunday sermons are pretty similar. They usually have in them somewhere the joke about how Christians can't do math, right? You know this one, 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1, but don't worry, I won't uh, make you suffer through that one today. Also in there somewhere is a line that goes something like this. You can't understand. You can't comprehend the Trinity. But that's okay. God does not ask you to understand or to comprehend Him. Rather, all you need to do is to believe. To confess the Trinity. And first of all, before we go any further, this is true. However, I think it's only part of the picture. Yes, don't get me wrong. The Trinity is beyond our comprehension. Maybe we made that a little bit too clear at the Bible study uh, before this. And yes, all we are called to do is confess the Trinity. Yet I've been spending a lot of time in the Old Testament recently. And the more and more that I do the more and more I am convinced that this is something of a modern idea. Now don't get me wrong, the the people of the Old Testament worshipped the Trinity, confessed the Trinity, even if they didn't have the vocabulary or the words to explain it. Yet I believe that this dichotomy that we have set up, quite frankly, it would have confused the people of the Old Testament. If we can't understand, then we believe, we confess. I think this way of understanding the Trinity and understanding God, or at least interacting with it, quite frankly, is largely, I suspect, a response to the Enlightenment and the way that thinking uh, was done then. And I know that sometimes when the Enlightenment gets brought up, it's a bad thing, but this is not wrong, by the way. But I get the feeling that if we look to the Old Testament, the idea looks different. You see, in the Old Testament, the thought is more, if I don't understand, then I praise. I exalt. I adore. It seems to me that when the people of the Old Testament encounter God, their primary attitude is praise and exaltation. I think bar none, the greatest example of this in the Old Testament is that of Miriam. You remember, right? When she gets to the other side of the Red Sea, along with all of the other Israelites, after having witnessed God ten times smiting the Egyptians with His mighty outstretched arm, Eleven, if you count the utter destruction of Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, as the Israelites cross safely to the other side. And when she sees this, when the congregation of Israel sees this, what do they do? They break out into song. Miriam leading the congregation of Israel in worship on the far bank of the Red Sea. Isaiah does this in the Old Testament text for today, although in his own slightly terrified sort of way. 
I am undone. I am in front of a holy, high, and lifted up God. The Psalms. They are jam-packed full. Not with hymns and songs of confession, but with hymns of praise and exaltation. I've recently been studying three of the twelve minor prophets. And of the three, Joel, Habakkuk, and Micah, every single one of them ends in exaltation. Ends in hymns and liturgies of praise and adoration to God, even though God brings such terrible judgments and is displayed in awe and might. These three minor prophets, and I know a number of others, in reaction, sing the praise of God. Perhaps then, on this Trinity Sunday, our response is simple. Using the words of Psalm 48 and what happened to be the opening of our gradual today as well. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. As we look to the Father and all that He has done, creation by His Word out of nothing, our response is great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. As we watch as the Father preserves the world, preserves us and everything in it, we shout out great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. When we look to the Son, True God who in the incarnation brought the true human nature into Himself for us. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. As we watch God and man living this life, suffering, dying, and rising again, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. As our Lord ascends into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, has our name constantly in His ear, and is coming again soon to judge the living and the dead, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. As we watch the Holy Spirit enlightening us in the faith, sanctifying us by His gifts, great is the Lord, and greatly to be to be praised. As the Holy Spirit works here in our midst through the means of grace, showering us with the gifts of the Spirit, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Even through the potential drudgery of the Athanasian Creed, as we confess the majesty of the divine Trinity, three persons, one God, Three lords, yet one Lord. Three eternals, yet one eternal. Three almighties, yet one almighty. Neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. Even then, great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. It is true that it is unnecessary for us to comprehend the Trinity. And thank God for that. It is true that it is good to believe and to confess the Trinity. But let us also give highest honor and praise, adoration and exaltation to the holy and most blessed Trinity as well. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, world without end. Amen.